Robbie, thanks so much for joining us. I, I just want to let everybody know they can see your full bio in the chat, but he manages a combined acreage of almost uh, 11,500 acres for intensively for Bob White quail. Uh, he's a graduate of Mississippi State University, and uh, he's been burning for Bob White's in the Red Hills region since 1997. Robbie, thanks so much. You got the floor. All right. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you, everyone, having me here today. I'm honored by the opportunity to share how we burn for quail <clears throat> on these truly beautiful properties. And I would add that when Kevin asked me to do this presentation, I was, I was actually at the Orchard City Brewery in Apalachicola, Florida. And so he may have caught me in a moment of weakness as I agreed to do it. But uh, and, my, and my first thought was, man, there must not be anybody good available as I uh, I'm a much better practitioner than speaker, but we're going to do the best we can with it. So uh, burning for Bob White to so look at prescribed fire on Osceola and Tolocus plantations. Osceola and Tolocus are properties that are located in the Red Hills of South Georgia, and they are multi use properties used for timber production, farming uh, and recreation. Osceola is in Thomas County, Georgia. Uh, Tolocus is located in Brooks County, Georgia. Uh, they're about 25 miles apart from each other. Osceola was assembled from in the 1940s and 50s through the purchase of some 40 plus individual properties by Mr. W.D. Cox of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the Williams and Parker family purchased Osceola in the 1980s and it has been intensively managed for quail since the 1940s. Uh, Tolocus Plantation, on the other hand, was developed by the Bryce family in the 1830s, and it was purchased from the Bryce family in the 1970s. Uh, interestingly, Tolocus has only been owned by two families since the 1830s, and I bet it's really difficult to find a property of this size that you can say that about. Uh, Tolocus has been managed intensively for wild quail since the 1960s. And so here's a further breakdown of these two properties. And as far as habitat goes, they're, they're basically reverse images of each other. Um, Osceola is the larger of the two properties. Uh, combined, there are about 21 quail courses, 15 on Osceola, six on Tolocus. There is significantly less quail acres on Tolocus because Bryce's Pond is located dead in the center of the property. And Bryce's Pond is a man-made 1,000 acre pond that was constructed originally for rice and energy uh, and an energy source for milling. Uh, today we use it for duck hunting. So our primary management goals for this property include managing timber with a lean towards quail. And, and I realize that's a really ambiguous uh, goal, but what it does is it provides a very flexible framework in which we can work. You know, it forces management to find a balance meaning you, you can't consider timber without considering quail, and you can't consider quail without considering timber. Um, next goal would be striving for long-term sustainability. The family that owns these properties has told us that they have the resources to manage these properties for 100 years, but they want us to figure out how to manage for 200 years. And, and they say this because they realize these properties are uh, what binds these, this family together. And so this is, for, this is forcing us to really think and plan on very long timelines. Uh, a primary goal, a, a final primary goal would be creating optionality. And what I'm referring to here, and, and it's something that's been going on in the Red Hills for quite some time on these large uh, family owned uh, shooting properties is basically a large amount of wealth was created back in the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. And these properties were, were purchased and then managed for recreation. But over time and through generational succession, a large amount, the large amount of wealth has dwindled, uh, creating difficulties in managing the properties, much less owning them. And, and, and so in an effort to stave off maybe the inevitable, some of these families have employed strategies to try to slough off acreage uh, in the hopes that they can reduce that property down to a manageable size. But really what happens in the end is, is they reduce their options and, and, and they, they, they can't seem to find a way to work out of it and they end up having to sell anyway. And so we're trying to create options for tomorrow through strategic land acquisition, 
trying that, that will create a, a very diverse mix of farmland, timberland, and hunting. Uh, objectives for this prop or for both properties includes creating sources of income to offset expense. And this ties directly back to that, that goal of sustainability and creating options for the future. Uh, we want to create value on every acre. My general manager calls it going Dutch. And, and what he means by that is if, if you look at a satellite image of the Netherlands, every inch of every acre is perfectly arranged and, and all of it is contributing to the whole. Um, when I came to Osceola and Salocus, one of the first things I noticed were there were these corners and, and odd areas uh, that where we, we weren't growing any timber, we weren't farming, we weren't even hunting these acres. We, we were simply just paying land taxes on, on, on that land. So very quickly, we began focusing on that low hanging fruit, meaning it was an easy decision to put those areas back into say reforestation or, or maybe farming or even clean it up and fold it back into our hunting program. Uh, we also have a compartmentalization objective. And what we mean by that is we wanna put things where it makes the most sense. We wanna farm where it makes most sense to farm. We wanna grow timber where it makes sense to grow timber. And we wanna manage for quail where that makes the most sense. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and when we do that, we want to create economies of scale. Uh, a good example of, of that is when I came to Osceola and Tolocus, we were farming almost every two to five acre field on the property. And, and I'm going to tell you, there's not a farmer in the world that wants to farm two to five acres at a time. So what we did is we created farming compartments out on the edges of the property, removing that farming from the quail woods and, and providing a place where a farmer can can work on hundreds of acres at a time, rather than constantly moving from one small field to another small field. And then finally, of course, we always want to provide multiple recreational opportunities for the family that owns these properties. And so these are quail properties and, and Tall Timbers has given us that management recipe for a very long time. And that recipe is thin your pine timber and reduce your hardwood encroachment in the uplands burn aggressively, create a supplemental feeding program, manage, manage your shooting and hunting pressure, and you might consider predator management, but only after you've got that habitat is as good as you can get it. Uh, as always in something like this, the devil's in the details. Of course, we're gonna focus on the burn aggressively portion of that recipe. So on Osceola and Tolocus, we let our habitat types dictate how and when we're going to apply fire. Uh, we break those habitats into two groups, basically old field and native. Old field habitats occur where you've had some disturbance, and most often in the Red Hills, that disturbance was agriculture. Uh, a good example of that is on both properties, we have very beautiful stands of mature planted slash pine. And, and, and if you look close in those stands on, you know, at the ground level, you can find old terraces where that land was formed prior to being planted in pine. And, and without those terraces, you might assume that land has always been in a pine forest when in fact it was probably a cotton field a hundred years ago. Uh, native habitats in the Red Hills occur where there has been no disturbance typically. And these habitats are dominated by wiregrass and, the, and other associated plant communities. On our old field sites, we rarely begin burning those before March 20. And we sometimes will burn these into May. And on those native sites, we almost never burn them before April 15. And we very often burn into May. In both the uh, habitat types, we're trying to reduce the hardwood sprouts and generate more grasses and forbs. In those native habitat, native habitats, we're, we're burning them much later, trying to elicit a, a flowering response from that wiregrass so that we create that vertical cover rather than that dense low mat of cover that we've all seen or some of us have probably seen in poorly managed wiregrass. And so in my mind, there's no two pictures that do a better job of explaining old field and native habitats than these two images. When you think of old, old field habitats, you should be thinking lots of soil disturbance and very little soil disturbance in native habitats. These are a few points that we feel like that we have 
we have learned as we've managed for quail in, in these two habitat types. Um, old field habitats respond very well to big disturbances that set back plant succession. And very often you're trying to create, uh, you know, a new ground effect. And, and we do that through V-blading excessive live oaks on the hills or roller chopping heavy cover, trying to chop that cover down, disturb the soil and get that flush of that, you know, that new, that new weedy growth. Um, on average, there's lots of cover in both height and density on old fill sites. And, and for this reason, wet years can be especially tough on a quail popula population, particularly on those heavy clay soils where you have that excessive understory cover. Uh, quail broods can often find it very difficult to dry out after those heavy rains. And, and you may experience lower survival because of this. Um, and, and, and as a result of some of that, you can, you can have um, significant quail population swings in old field habitats from season to season. Um, hunt success on old field habitats can be more consistent across a wider range of, of weather conditions. Those native habitats, on the other hand, respond much better to very subtle changes in land management. When, when native habitats are disturbed, you lose plant diversity, and often what you get back is an understory dominated by smilax, for instance, or lots of invasive grasses such as bahia. And, you know, you can increase the productivity and diversity of native habitats uh, by altering the timing and, and intensity of your burns. Basically, you want to shift your burning to that late April, early May, maybe even mid-May. Native habitats managed correctly can produce a quail population that is more stable and consistent over time than old field habitats. And, and this is key here, and you can usually do it with much lower management costs. And that's simply because you're using fire than diesel fuel and tractors and roller choppers and mowers and people in the seats of the tractors. So, you know, there is one negative regarding native ground cover. And, and that can be hunt success can be lower on those, on those hot or cold, very dry days. On days such as that, hunting quail and, and wiregrass, it can sometimes feel as though there's not a quail in the world. And so our burn season always begins with the creation of these maps. Uh, in quail management, we're trying to create a mosaic of burned and unburned areas across the landscape. Uh, traditionally in the Red Hills, we accomplish this using what we called ring out. These ring outs were often two to five acre ring shaped areas that were haired, you know, haired around to exclude the fire. And the assumption was these ring outs that dotted the landscape were where your nesting would occur. And your brood habitat would be located outside of that ring or in fallow fields located nearby. And this system worked, though some managers and, and, and properties were better at this than others. A real downside to this approach was it's very inefficient, it's very expensive, and it's very time consuming to lay that burn plan out across the landscape. Uh, these days, a lot of quail properties are using a method of burning known as block burning. And basically block burning uh, is an alternating arrangement of 20 to 40 acre blocks of burned and unburned habitat across the landscape. And this creates that patchwork quilt mosaic. And so the burn map for Tolocus plantation is, is much like the Osceola map, simply that 20 to 40 acre uh, blocks laid out in an alternating fashion, trying to create that mosaic. On the map on the left, those, the green blocks there represent our unburned or nesting blocks, and the yellow, pink, and blue blocks represent the burn blocks for any, kit, any current burn, burn season. Um, our goal each year is to burn 50% of the quail acres, leaving 50% unburned. Um, this was one of the significant problems with the old traditional ring out method of burning uh, quail properties here in the Red Hills. Uh, under that type of burn plan, often you were burning 70 or 80% of the landscape. And, and that can and does work in quail management, but you better be getting good rainfall and you better you better glean up quickly after that burn or you're very likely going to see predation rates increase and, 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 and because of that uh, likely produce a, a much lower quail population than you might have under a block burning system that, that somewhat hedges your bet. 
On both properties, we use the colors yellow, pink, and blue to illustrate and manage the timing of how we're going to burn these blocks. The yellow represents our old field habitat blocks and will be the first blocks that we burn in any given burn season. Uh, the pink blocks uh, may be either old field or native and, and represent that second pass through those burn blocks. And, and then finally, the blue blocks are almost exclusively native ground cover. Uh, that are burned as we come through for that third and final time. Using Osceola as an example, uh, this animated slide gives you somewhat of an idea of how we, um, we begin our burning and, and how we like to scatter those burns across the landscape over a long period of time. We like to scatter our burns uh, across that property, across the properties because, for, well, for several reasons, but primarily we're doing it in quail management because you're always hedging your bet. There's only one absolute in quail management and that's dead hens lay no eggs. And, and burning, you know, is gonna be the most important management tool we have. And you've got to burn to set back that plant succession, but you have to be very careful with the duration of time in which you expose those birds, um, to, you know, to predation because you've taken that cover away from them. You, you know, we want that soil temperature to be rising and hopefully we have good, good, uh, excuse me, you want that soil temperature to be rising and you want that soil moisture to be very good so that that green up occurs as quickly as possible. And, and if you can get, you know, if you can get that cover back on your burn areas, you stand a much better chance of limiting that predation and carrying more of those egg laying hens into that breeding season. So we conduct our burns using uh, three Honda ATVs to set fire, two John Deere tractors and a gator uh, with water tanks to mop up the fire lines. And we usually have about six people on the burns. Uh, we don't like haired fire lines. Typically we're using the same fire lines every year. And that repeated herring uh, of those fire lines typically creates a mess it, that you're gonna have to spend a lot of time and money on trying to repair. We do use a haired perimeter break around the property, but th those interior lines are most often grassy roads or field edges. What haired, uh, harrowed interior lines we are using um, where are, are places where we're not gonna get that erosion and, and, and we're gonna incur very little, very little maintenance. Uh, grassy, grassy roads work very well as a fire break, especially if you use a hay rake to roll any fuel on that road over to the, the, the side away from that burn block. And typically it's a very easy task for the tractors and the water wagons to come in there and, and put out, mop up any of that creeping fire along the edge of the burn. Most often we've got two ATVs burning the larger blocks with one tractor and the gator mopping together, mopping up that fire. Uh, the gator also spends a lot of its time running back to, to, to check those previous burn blocks, looking for problems or, or any potential for fire escapes. Uh, then we'll have one separate ATV and another tractor usually working on those much smaller blocks. And we just hopscotch our way, you know, across the property for that burn day. Once we've secured the block with, with black lines and backing and fires, we use a strip head firing technique to complete burning the block. And, you know, we're always burning two-year fuels that mostly consist of pine litter, grass, forbs, and, and woody shrubs. And that strip head firing technique uh, creates a, a, a quick, very hot fire that works really well to top, to top kill those hardwoods and, and remove that litter and, and, and allows us to quickly move across the block and wrap up the burn. And, and of course, we control the intensity of that fire by, by adjusting the spacing of our stripping. In those deep fuels, we'll tighten up those strips, and then those lighter fuels will widen out some. And so when I share how we burn Osceola and Silocus with people, almost always they say, that's great, Robbie, but, but how's your honey? Um, this graph shows our hunt productivity for the last 10 years. It's good, solid hunting that anybody would be happy with. Uh, one thing that I've learned over time is if you can keep your ownership occupied with hunting high populations of quail, very often they don't notice the problems that are occurring maybe on the property, things that you haven't gotten to yet. So there's definitely some side benefits of having, uh, having a, a large population of quail. 
Uh, our burn plan and how we burn is not solely responsible for our quail success, but, but I know it's significantly responsible. A couple of other interesting points to make, uh, you know, while these are averages uh, of Covey's move per hour, some of these quail courses that are represented in these averages have been over 12 and 14 Coveys per hour. Uh, the significant decline that you see there in 2017, ending in 18, was due to a severe drought. And had we burned more than our usual 50% that year, we likely would have seen our quail population fall even further. Uh, a final point I would make, um, and somewhat as a joke, uh, when I'm looking at this graph with, with my boss, my general manager, I always like to point out when I got to Osseo and Salopis, and that was in 2012. And so the bottom line, fire is your cheapest tool when, when you're trying to manage plant succession. Managing that plant succession is the key to good quail management. Remember those tractors, diesel fuel, mowers, roller choppers, all that stuff is way more expensive than fire. Uh, second point would be you can't manage what you don't measure. You need to develop a plan and you need to map your burn. You need to know exactly what you're burning. Uh, and the cool thing is once you do that, you, you don't have to reinvent your wheel you know, every year. Once you've developed it, once you've mapped your burn, you simply just reverse that plan for every year. And, and then because you're always burning two year fuels, you typically have a fire that carries better, burns hotter, it burns more complete, and typically there's way less mowing. Um, burn frequency and scale timing are all key to using fire correctly in quail management. You wanna be doing a two year return interval. Ideal block size is 20 to 40 acres. And you should never be afraid to burn into late April or into the first part of May, especially in your native ground cover. And then, of course, last but not least, smoke management. The main point there is it's much easier to manage smoke on 12 individual 20 to 40 acre fires than one 250 acre fire. And that's what I've got there, Kevin. Thanks so much, Robbie. We sure appreciate it. And that's a very, very fancy PowerPoint. Maybe you should uh, teach me some tricks on how to get that stuff to spin around like that. Um, I appreciate you talking about growing season burns. I know a lot of people are worried about uh, ground nesting birds and burning that time of year. And, you know, this did come up in your thing. Absolutely. You didn't say it speci specifically, but yes, timing and changing uh, scale and intensity and timing is going to give you lots of cool different species. So think about that. Uh, we do have a couple questions from the audience. Let me scroll over here for that. Um, yeah, someone's asking about the average residual basal area in your quail focus areas. Um, so typically, our, our, our timber stands are running in that 40 to 60 range, 40 to 60 square feet of basal area. But uh, the cool thing about longleaf, and we do have a lot of longleaf is in quail management, especially in native ground cover, you, you can run a much higher basal area. You've got those very open uh, canopies and longleaf, lets a lot of sunlight through. And, and I'm not sure wiregrass would get any taller if you cut every tree down. So we, we try to maintain a pretty dense forest, especially in our in our, in our native ground cover. Yeah, so along with the uh, native ground cover stuff, have you heard of it, many other um, quail managers trying your native ground cover approach? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to them weekly. I'm trying to convert a lot of folks here. And I know there's some out there. Uh, I wish there were a lot more. Yeah, we're trying to promote that on uh, public lands as well. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for your time, Robbie. And I just want a, a quick note to people. If you do see a Bob White quail that's taller than five feet, might be burner Bob. Just don't shoot at him. Just throwing that out there. Uh, appreciate it. Wow. Th thank you so much, Robbie. I really appreciate his fantastic presentation. Um, we're going to have to get you to give uh, give my my presentations in the future. That That was really wonderful. Very informative. Uh, and a model for, you know, possibly public land quail management. Just really, really impressive. Uh